7.30 p.m. Hello, I'm Motelli Edwards on News 5 tonight. Chinese activist Chen Guangcheng leaves the U.S. Embassy in Beijing after what some are calling a win-win arrangement for all involved. Aung San Suu Kyi takes a historic oath in Myanmar's parliament. The U.S. president vows to end the war in Afghanistan as he makes a surprise visit on Osama bin Laden's death anniversary and... This, this is not a sort of thing where you want to say that we have a master plan, let's build it in three years' time. Don't rush into developing a rail corridor, says Singapore's president. He feels it could take up to 10 years. First tonight, Chinese dissident Chen Guangcheng has left the U.S. Embassy in Beijing of his own accord. He had been there for six days following his escape from house arrest in Shandong province. He's said to have been escorted out of the embassy by U.S. Ambassador to China, Gary Locke. The blind activist is now at a medical facility in Beijing. He received treatment and was reunited with his family. Both the U.S. and China had maintained official silence on the case until now. U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, who's in Beijing, issued a statement saying Washington remains committed to Chen. Beijing, meanwhile, denounced the U.S. and demanded an apology. Our Beijing correspondent has more now from the Chinese capital. This was the video of human rights lawyer Chen Guangcheng released last week in which he confirmed his escape from house arrest in Shandong. His fate has distracted U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, who's arrived in Central Beijing for this year's round of high-level economic and strategic talks between China and America. Both countries are facing pressure to resolve the issue quickly, as Chen Guangcheng is the second high-profile Chinese citizen after Wang Lijun to seek political asylum in an American embassy in China this year. Ruguan but while the U.S. has managed to raise awareness of Chen's plight and perhaps ensure his safety for now, the eventual fate of the human rights lawyer is uncertain. You还是做维权律师? And even though the case has gained international prominence and sympathy, it's unlikely America and China will take drastic steps in its decisions, especially when China is undergoing a major leadership change at the end of the year and America is having its presidential elections in November. Valerie Tan, Channel News Asia, Beijing. And our U.S. Bureau Chief has reaction from Washington. It looks as though an arrangement was crafted here that allows everybody to get what they want. Mr. Chen gets to stay in China and he gets some kind of guarantees from the Chinese authorities over uh, the treatment that he will receive and his family will receive, particularly at the hands of local officials. The United States gets to say, we did the right thing by Mr. Chen, and China gets to say publicly, as we heard, that it is not happy about the role the United States has played in all of this, uh, which it perceives as an interference in its own internal affairs. The United States clearly intends to continue monitoring uh, the uh, conduct of Chinese authorities towards Mr. Chen. Now, how they go about doing that in the weeks, months and years ahead is going to be, I think, a very big question uh, for Secretary of State Hillary Clinton to answer when she faces reporters. Uh, but that certainly appears to be the broad terms of the arrangement that for now at least is in place with regard to Mr. Mr. Chen's future. 
In other headlines, Aung San Suu Kyi has been sworn in as a member of Myanmar's parliament, opening a new chapter in her nearly a quarter century fight for democracy. Her presence in the House could help speed up the pace of reform, but she also faces the daunting task of managing public expectations. It was an obstacle to her entry into parliament, but Aung San Suu Kyi hurdled over it with flexibility. In unison with 33 other members of her National League for Democracy party, she read the brief oath to which she had initially objected, specifically a sentence pledging to safeguard the army-created constitution. She had said it's undemocratic and needs to be amended to reduce the political role of the armed forces. But she eventually gave in because it was the desire of the people to see her party in office after they were elected to the lower house in April. It was the uh, ethnic nationality parties who tried to sweep away, or not just tried, but succeeded in sweeping away for us to come to uh, a decision. Despite sweeping the by-elections, the NLD occupies too few seats to have any real power in the ruling party-dominated assembly. On the other hand, the military have a quarter of the seats in parliament under the constitution. Still, Ms. Suu Kyi says she's pleased to be sitting together with the military men. We would like our parliament to be in line with genuine democratic values. It's not because we want to remove anybody as such. We just want to make the kind of improvements that will make our National Assembly a truly democratic one. Analysts say the Nobel laureate is aware that she needs the support of Myanmar's armed forces or Tatmadaw. She has clearly mentioned that without the support of the Tatmadaw, they will never be able to bring about changes in the country, the genuine changes that people would like to see. While well, there are fears that the presence of the opposition lawmakers could simply legitimize the regime without any change, many are hopeful that they will bring a new level of public debate to the legislative body as they prepare for the next general election in 2015. It's exactly one year since Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden was killed by U.S. Special Forces. And the U.S. President chose this day to make a surprise trip to Afghanistan. In a visit lasting just six hours, he signed a deal with the Afghan President pledging long-term ties even after U.S. troops return home. And he delivered an address to America broadcast from Afghan Air Base. One year ago, from a base here in Afghanistan, our troops launched the operation that killed Osama bin Laden. The goal that I set to defeat al-Qaeda and deny it a chance to rebuild is now within our reach. We must finish the job we started in Afghanistan and end this war responsibly. But in defiance of Mr. Obama's claim that the time of war was ending, the Taliban militant group carried out a car bomb attack in Kabul hours later. It happened outside a compound housing Westerners. Seven people died, including a security guard and a young girl. Meanwhile, the killing of Osama bin Laden is turning into an explosive political issue in the U.S. ahead of November's presidential election. A year after he was killed, Osama bin Laden is proving to be as divisive in death as he was in life. Mitt Romney, the likely Republican nominee, has been criticised by the Obama administration. The Democrats say he may not have made the decision to take down bin Laden had he been president. But today, Romney hit back. I think it was very disappointing uh, for the president to try and make this a political item by suggesting that I wouldn't have ordered uh, such, a, uh, such a raid. Of course I would have. Any, any, uh, any American, uh, any thinking American would have ordered exactly the same thing. But of course you give the president the credit for the fact that he did so. And this is what Mitt Romney is so unhappy about. A Democrat campaign advert featuring former President Bill Clinton. An advert designed to undermine Romney and make the most of Obama's success. He took the harder and the more honorable path. And the one that produced, in my opinion, the best result. But the president denies this is simply a gratuitous act to help him get re-elected. I, I hardly think that you've seen any excessive celebration uh, taking place here. Uh, I think that people, the American people rightly, uh, remember what we as a country accomplished uh, in bringing to justice uh, somebody who killed uh, over 3,000 of our citizens. 
It's the president's single greatest foreign policy accomplishment, and it's sort of fair game for him to use this. Uh, the Romney campaign complains that he goes a step further and then says, well, maybe Mitt Romney actually wouldn't have made the same call. That's where you get into a potential danger zone that you're politicizing an issue and it could potentially backfire. Using Osama bin Laden was always going to be an easy hit for President Obama and the White House. It gives him a chance to maximize on his success while also discrediting his opponent for a decision he never even had a chance to make. With six months still to run until the election, fighting between these two men is only likely to get more ferocious. Nick Harper, Channel News Asia, Washington. Elsewhere, Malaysia's Home Minister has called last weekend's birthday rally one of the darkest chapters in the country's history. As you'll remember, the protest turned violent and an independent panel will now be set up to investigate alleged wrongdoing, including by police. We will compile all the visuals that we have with PDRM and KDN and we will show it to the whole world to see. For those who are blinkered, they do not want to see the truth, well, that is their decision. But the majority of Malaysians are law-abiding citizens who do not want to see this happen. Very ugly incident, but it's also a good lesson for us. Thank God no real damage was done. But we are still counting the costs. Tens of thousands of Malaysians had turned up in central Kuala Lumpur for the birthday 3.0 rally, demanding free and fair elections. Things turned ugly after they forced their way past barricades and police fired tear gas and water cannon to disperse the crowd. Still ahead on News 5, key contributors to Singapore's government feedback portal get the chance to meet policymakers face to face. And England's new football manager meets the media, laying out plans to prove his critics wrong. Only. Welcome back. The president of Singapore has urged the government not to rush into developing the rail corridor. That refers to land which was formerly used for the railway to Malaysia. The president says it's more important to wait for good ideas. The plans for the rail corridor are still up in the air, and President Tony Tan hopes things stay that way for now. I would say for this one, perhaps it's a little bit different what we are doing. Take your time. Don't rush into doing things saying we must have a plan and we must finish it by in two, three years time, things must be done. We take our time to study the possibilities. Dr Tan said he is happy that Singaporeans or various community groups have expressed great interest in the rail corridor. He said the government should continue to find ways to engage different groups and hear their ideas. And the Urban Redevelopment Authority's ideas competition is a good way to get new ideas. But he also said authorities should be flexible in experimenting to find out what works best. This you have a concept, you work on it, you try out things, it may not work, then you can change it. And I think it may take us up to 10 years before the whole thing settles down into an asset which can be enjoyed by all Singaporeans and which more important will reflect the aspirations and the interests of Singaporeans of all groups. One way this will be done is through the Rail Corridor Partnership, which includes government agencies, interest groups and individuals who are part of the Rail Corridor Consultation Group. Chaired by Minister of State for National Development, Tan Chuan Jin, the new partnership now includes agencies such as the Education Ministry, the Singapore Sports Council and the People's Association. And they will explore ways to promote community use of the Rail Corridor. Now, the agencies that have just joined the Rail Corridor Partnership will also gather feedback from the community events organised. This, together with the proposals from the Ideas Competition, will set the stage for the Rail Corridor Master Plan. They've been actively contributing to government feedback portal REACH, and tonight some 200 contributors got the chance to have a face-to-face -face discussion with key policymakers on the challenges facing Singapore. The annual REACH Contributors Forum involved National Development Minister Corbin Wan, Acting Minister for Community Development, Youth and Sports Chan Chun Singh and REACH Chairman Amy Kaur. 
National Development Minister Kaur Bunwan took many questions from the audience relating to housing issues. Besides frustrations raised over HDB policies favoring married children, there are also concerns raised over the size of HDB units getting smaller and the impact this would have on family bonding. Is it because the family, modern family is getting smaller, so the assumption made is that we don't need so much space? And there has been this misunderstanding that somehow in recent years HDB has shrunk the units. We have not. But we have built, we continue to build smaller units and large units, and then it is the choice of the consumers. There is probably a, a place in the whole, uh, we have 1.2 million housing units, that some could be of that size, and because there will be people who find it comfortable for their purpose, you know, instead of having a big place and then very hard to maintain, or more costly to buy and to maintain. But I think if the percentage becomes too many, then I think we may have to step in to say, hey, you know, that uh, are you sure that there will be demand for it? Other issues raised included political awareness and the role of government. Reach says it's seeing more and better quality feedback because more Singaporeans want to have their say and it's easier for them to do so online. Next, the latest from the public inquiry into last year's MRT breakdowns. Questions were raised today about whether inspections were thorough enough prior to the second train disruption on 17th December. A maintenance worker said he and a partner checked 900 metres of track in about 20 minutes early that day. The inspection covered 210 items, including 150 rail claws. Several such claws had been found to be dislodged after the first train disruption two days earlier. The inquiry also heard that there were no standard operating procedures for tunnel checks. Singapore's biggest supermarket operator, NTUC Fairprice, has announced a four-year plan to boost volunteerism among its staff. Last year, they chalked up 200 hours of volunteer work spread across a dozen projects. NTUC aims to hit 2,300 hours by 2016 in 75 projects. It will work with welfare groups like YMCA, Renzi Nursing Home and the Society for the Physically Disabled. And it's picked 13 staff to drive the initiative. Research has shown that volunteerism goes up when employers lead the way. Business news is just ahead, plus a rusty ride that's actually a true treasure. Tell you about its amazing post-tsunami voyage and how it could soon be heading home again. In business news, Singapore's central bank has issued a revised code of corporate governance. The key changes focus on these areas. Director independence, board composition, multiple directorships, alternate directors and remuneration practices. The revised code takes effect from November. The Action Community for Entrepreneurship, or ACE, will play matchmaker to 11 promising startups in a one-year men mentoring program launched today. ACE Chairman and Minister of State for Trade and Industry, Teo Salak, awarded grants worth up to $50,000 each to the selected recipients. It's just one of ACE's initiatives to help grow local businesses. And here are the market numbers. Football manager Roy Hodgson is promising to win over the skeptics and says he's well aware of the tough task ahead in getting the team ready for Euro 2012. His first match in charge will be a friendly against Norway on 26 of May. That's three days before he names his squad for the European Championships. Months of speculation for England's top job have ended. England's Football Association is putting its weight behind Roy Hodgson to succeed Fabio Capello, who resigned abruptly as England manager in February. At 64, Hodgson is the oldest to take on the position. He says his appointment is the pinnacle of a varied managerial career spanning almost 40 years. I'm a very happy man to have been offered the chance of managing my country. Hodgson has won league titles in Sweden and Denmark and led Italian club Inter Milan to the 1997 UEFA Cup final. He also took Fulham to the 2010 Europa League final, the club's first ever European final. He even managed the UAE, Finland and impressively led European minnows Switzerland to the 1994 World Cup and 1996 Euro Championships. But the England job is his biggest yet. 
I'm uh, looking forward enormously to the task ahead. Everyone knows it's not an easy one. He's not the popular choice, though, with many having tipped charismatic Tottenham Hotspur manager Harry Redknapp for the job. Failed stints at Liverpool and Blackburn Rovers have also raised some concern among English fans. But many players are backing him, including Arsenal's Jack Wiltshire and Liverpool captain Steven Gerrard. Hodgson believes his record speaks for itself. Given my CV, given the work I've done over the years, I've succeeded fairly well with that. Every coach's job, when he enters a new job, it's to win the players over. To... Hodgson's honeymoon period won't be long, though, with Euro 2012 coming up in just over a month. And what I would do is I'll do my very best to make sure the team is as well prepared as possible for the task that lie ahead. But I certainly think that the players would be very disappointed if we expected anything less of them than an attempt to win the tournament. Even the English press are backing Hodgson, the manager who made his name abroad, but has finally landed the biggest job at home. Staying with football, Liverpool manager Kenny Dalglish has slammed his team after their latest defeat on home ground. A fifth-minute own goal by defender Martin Skirtel gave Fulham their first win at Anfield in 49 attempts. Dalglish rested key players ahead of this weekend's FA Cup final against Chelsea. And he insists they'll still go into that, that match with confidence. As for the Fulham game, he says the Reds got what they deserved, which was absolutely nothing. Seven-time snooker world champion Stephen Hendry is calling time on his career. He made the announcement after losing 13-2 in the quarterfinals of the world championship. But the 42-year-old says he made the decision months ago, citing other commitments and adding that he simply doesn't enjoy practice anymore. This was Hendry's 27th consecutive world championship. He was the youngest player ever in the crucible and the most successful winning a record seven times in the 1990s. Away from sport, a Japanese man has come forward to claim a Hardy Harley that was found halfway around the world. You see, the motorcycle was swept away in last year's tsunami and drifted over 6,000 kilometers across the Pacific Ocean before washing up in Canada. A local man found the Hot Wheels inside a container where it had been stored. It was rusty, but the Japanese license plate was still visible. The find was broadcast in Canada and word reached Japan. The 29-year-old owner says it was an eye-popping moment when he recognized his favorite ride in a photo. There is a problem, though. Dick. But there may be a happy ending. The dealer who sold him the Harley has volunteered to store the beloved bike. And Harley Davidson itself is considering helping to repair the ride and transport it to Japan for free. And that's News 5 tonight. Good night.